we looked at line integrals of vector fields along curves. Line integrals specifically care about the component of the vector field that's tangent to the curve. Now we're going to look at uh, integrals on surfaces in space, and we'll have a vector field. And instead of looking at components of the vector field that are tangent to the surface, we're going to look at the component of the vector field that's perpendicular to the surface, or normal to the surface. Um, this is a measure of, if you're talking about fluid flow, for instance, if your vector field is the velocity vector field of some flowing fluid, this measures the volume, the volume of liquid that moves through your surface in a, in a per time unit. Um, we also talk about, even when we're not talking about velocity vector fields, but we also are very interested in, in integrating force vector fields and looking at the components normal to a surface. These kinds of integrals where we look of, of normal components of vector fields over surfaces are called flux integrals, and we care about both the, the flux involved in fluid flow and the electric flux from an electric field, um, the flux of force fields through surfaces. It's a measure of how much force is kind of flowing through the, you think, flowing through the surface um, per time unit. All right, so we need, in this section, I should say, that in this section, we will have to go back and use a lot of what we've done, parameterizing surfaces, um, area elements on surfaces. I'll, to shorten some examples, I'll have to appeal to uh, some calculations we did earlier. Uh, this is very complicated to calculate. It's very time consuming nonetheless. All right, so um, suppose you've got a surface in space, and I'm picturing a smooth surface. So I'm thinking of the parameters, uh, the image of the parameterization of, um, of a surface, so a basic parameterization that we talked about a long time ago. So here's some surface in space, and we want to pick a positive direction on the surface. So we need the notion of an oriented surface. There's, you know, you can, at any point here, there, there are two, two normal directions. If you pick a unit normal, you can either go that way or you can go that way, so into the surface. And an orientation on the surface is a, is a smooth choice, or at least a continuous choice of a of one collection of normal vectors. So you want an orientation on the vector field, uh, on the surface, not on the vector field. So we usually denote these by n. So we, we fix a choice of positive unit normal vectors, positive, that's just by declaration. So we just decide, OK, I'm going to think of that as the positive direction. Or I could have picked the other way as being the positive direction. But you specify what it is. Assuming you can make such a, a consistent choice of n, so a nice continuous choice of unit normals, uh, we say the surface is orientable, and we, an orientation is, dis, is the actual choice of your positive unit normals. Of course, then the negative orientation would be where you negate all of those, and the unit normals point the other way. Um, and now suppose we have the velocity vector field of some fluid. So some fluid is flowing, and it's got some velocity vector field. So velocity vector field of flowing fluid. So I'm going to, just to fix some units, in meters per second. So this vector field tells you at each point what the velocity of the, the fluid is that's there. Well then, on our oriented surface, now I'm going to erase this, you'll have the points, the velocity vector field will be here. I'm drawing it really big, just to make a point. We'll have a unit normal 
vector. And what we're interested in is the volume of fluid that flows through the surface in a given in a per time unit. So I'm going to indicate an infinitesimal little chunk of area on the surface of so the area element that we looked at in an earlier section. Um, so here's a little chunk of area, I think infinitesimal piece of area on the surface at this point. What we want is kind of the component of the velocity that's in the direction of the normal, but we only want its magnitude. So we want the dot product. We want, we look at V dot N. This is a measure of how much of this velocity vector is normal to the surface because the tangential components, so you could break this up into a vector, you can break V up into a vector that's normal to the surface and one that's tangent to the surface because it'll be perpendicular to the normal vector. Um, and this just gives us, well, the signed magnitude of the component of the velocity in the direction of the normal vector. So that's the part of the fluid that's trying to go through the surface, that's trying to escape. This other one is with the, the tangential component. That stuff is trying to stay inside the surface or not pass through it. So you look at this. This is in, this again will be in meters per second. Um, but to get the amount of volume that flows through in this little patch, you multiply times this little, little amount of area. So that would give you cubic meters per second. And we want to add all that up as we integrate over our surface M. So this is a flux integral. of V through M. Right? So we need this oriented surface, but then we have this flux integral. Great. So that's great. That's a definition of the flux integral. You, you pick an orientation, so you pick a consistent choice of, posit of what you're thinking of as the positive direction unit normals. You dot those with your vector field. You multiply by infinitesimal chunks of area on your surface and you integrate that over your surface. The question is, how do you calculate, how do you calculate such a thing? I and mean, we can define it, but how do you calculate? And hopefully, you know what we're, at least you know how we're going to start. How do you calculate? flux integrals. You parameterize the surface. And this is how we found area. Well, now this is something times little chunks of area, so, or little blobs of area, so it shouldn't come as much of a surprise. You parameterize. And of course, there are technical conditions on our parameterization. We, we want it to be a basic parameterization, as we defined before, but um, you parameterize. But I won't write all the, the technical, you know, but you take a parameterization. So you take some domain D. This is a subset of R2. Into R3. You parameterize M with image equal to M. Remember what, what this means. So our favorite kind of parameterization variables for a surface are U and V. You don't have to call them U and V. And in fact, I'll do examples where we have like theta and Z, but um, U and V. And you give these three. component functions in terms of u and v. All right, so what did we look at? Well, we looked at before when we did area of a parameterized surface. ds, if you have a parameterization, ds, this little chunk of 
curved area is you take the partial derivative of r with respect to u, you cross that, you take the cross product of that with the partial derivative of r with respect to t, you take the magnitude and you multiply it times du dv. So in terms of u and v, that's a little, an infinitesimal chunk of area. But we also know that n, our unit normal, well, we know how to get a normal vector to a parameterized surface. You take the cross product of ru and rv. So a unit normal, you, again, you take the cross product of ru and rv, but you want it to be a unit normal, so you divide by the magnitude. Now, I have to say a couple of things. Um, we are dealing with parameterizations that are nice, so basic parameterizations. In particular, they are regular, except maybe it points in a finite number of curves. Um, and regular means that this cross product is not zero. So um, you assume that this cross product is not zero, except possibly on a very small set that wouldn't affect the double integral over the manifold. OK, so this is defined. This is a unit normal, um, which could fail to exist on a small set, but I mean, because this denominator might be zero, but um, exists almost everywhere. But it might not be. So we have a, an oriented surface, which means we've picked a positive direction. Well, maybe this is giving the negative direction. There are two possible choices of unit normals, one direction, and it's negative. Maybe this is the wrong direction. So if it is, you have to check. You have to check that this has the direction you've specified as positive. And if it doesn't, switch what you're calling u and v or negate this. One way or the other, you need to check. You need to make this match the positive orientation, so your chosen orientation. And if it doesn't, you either negate it, or what's the same thing, you switch the roles of u and v, your chosen orientation. All right. Um, OK. So what do you get? So we want to calculate a double integral over d, our region in the uv plane. Well, so what we find is that this double integral, this flux integral, is when you take the double integral over this region that I've called d in the uv plane, you take your vector field, but you only evaluate it at points specified by your orientations. Yeah, normally think your vector field, oh, it's evaluated at x, y, z. Yeah, but only at x, y, z's on the surface M, which is exactly what you get from R of UV. You get the points on the surface. So you evaluate your vector field on the surface. You dot with this unit normal vector. And you multiply by ds, but ds is RU cross RV, DU, DV. And the nice thing, these cancel, and you are left with the double integral over D of your vector field evaluated at, at points given by your parameterization, dotted with RU cross RV times DU, DV. This could come out to be negative. Negative would mean that the net flow was in the direction opposite your orientation. Positive means there's a net flow um, in the direction of your orientation. But this is how you calculate flux integrals with this parameterization. Although, having said that, every now and then, just because things are flat and you can use geometry, you can calculate this kind of barehandedly, kind of just from the definition without parameterizing. We'll see that in a second. All right, let's do an example. So my first example, let's take the vector field to be V 
D equals x plus y minus x plus y e to the x y cubed z squared meters per second. In our surface, we're going to use a cylinder. Actually, I should draw some axes. Um, we're going to use a right circular cylinder whose base is in the xy plane of radius r and height h. So this will be h, this will be r, and this, the sides will be our surface m. No top, no bottom, so no top or bottom. We will pick the positive orientation to be outward, so out positively oriented normal vectors, unit normal vectors, point outward, not inward. That's the other choice. Um, all right, and we would like to calculate the flux of this vector field across that cylinder. So I, um, over the cylinder, we say lots of different prepositions in there. Over the cylinder, across the cylinder, through the cylinder, they all mean the same thing. All right, that's what we'd like to do. Here's how we do it. We need to parameterize the cylinder. Now, we've parameterized the cylinder before. Um, it's not hard to parameterize the cylinder, but I will appeal to our previous work for the, for the cross product. Our parameterization of the cylinder that we'll use theta and z for our parameters. It's you specify where you are on the circle and how high up you go. So it's so this. So you get r cosine of theta, r sine of theta, z. You uh, so I should say theta is between zero and two pi. Z is between 0 and h. We need to calculate the partial derivatives of r. So the partial with respect to theta is minus r sine theta, r cosine theta, 0. Now you can factor out the r if you want. This is r times minus the sine of theta, cosine of theta, zero. Our z is zero, zero, one. And you can just, well, maybe I'll, I'll do it again, but um, in general, it's uh, very time consuming to calculate flux integrals. And in the other examples, I will appeal to our previous work, but Let's go ahead and do this cross product. It's not bad. You put i here, j here, k here. You put the first vector in the next row, so you get um, you get minus r sine theta. I need more space. You get minus r sine theta, r cosine of theta, zero, and then zero, zero, one. What is this cross product? Well, um, you first you start at i, you delete the row and column containing i, you get r cosine of theta times i. Then you move to the next entry and the, the sign alternates. So you get minus and then you delete the row and column containing j, and you get minus r sine theta, minus zero, but minus minus, so you get plus r sine theta times j. And then for k, you delete the row and column containing k, the, the, the determinant of the remaining two by two matrix is zero, so you don't get anything there. So what you get is r cosine of theta, 
our sine of theta zero, or again, you can pull out the r. This is r times cosine of theta sine of theta zero. So that's r theta cross rz. All right, what do we need to do? Now we need to integrate over our region D, which is theta's between 0 and 2 pi, H between, between uh, Z between 0 and H. We plug our parameterization into the vector field. Uh, we dot with the cross product that we just produced, and we integrate with respect to theta, and, and we integrate with respect to theta and Z. All right, so we'll do that. So we want to calculate, well, I shouldn't have erased that. This is what we want to calculate, but I want to put it up here now. So we will have our region D is theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Z is between 0 and H. You, your vector field with your parameterization stuck in. Here's our vector field um, with the parameterization stuck in. Now, let me write the, write the parameterization over here where we can see it more easily. R theta z is R cosine theta, R sine theta, z. All right, so v v with r theta z stuck in it, so we can have theta and z. Uh, except I put my theta limits of integration on the outside, so I switch those two at the end because my theta limits of integration are already on the outside. v of r theta z, well here's v, you add x and y, so the x component and the y component, so v of r theta z, you get r cosine theta plus r sine theta. Then there's minus x plus y, so minus this plus this, so we get minus r sine theta, r cosine of theta plus r sine theta. And it's not gonna fit here, so I'm gonna have to, and this frequently happens when you're calculating these, you run out of horizontal space, so I'm going to have to put a dot product here, and you're going to have to keep track. Um, there is a third component, which is this ugly thing, but I'm not going to include it, but I should at least write it once, so, or at least put a space for it. I'm going to put an asterisk there that something goes there, but it's not going to matter what it is. Why not? Because we dot with r theta cross rz, which we found was r cosine of theta, sine of theta, zero. And because there's a zero there, when we take the dot product, you'll take, well, we can pull that r out, um, and then you get this times this, plus this times this, but plus this times this. Well, since there's a zero here, we don't care what's there, and it's just a waste of time to fill it in. So I usually put in a placeholder, just an asterisk, and then you put in dz d theta. And that's the integral that we have to do. So, all right, well, we have to do it. It may look bad, but it's not so awful. But make no mistake, calculating flux integrals is time consuming. You have to parameterize, you have to take the cross product, then you have to take that dot product, and then you have to integrate. Um, the integral from zero to two pi, the integral from zero to h, uh, we can pull this r all the way out, and in fact, we're going to have this times this plus this times this. There's another r we can pull out. So I'm going to pull out an r squared. And then you get a, a cosine squared plus sine theta cosine theta. So we get a cosine squared theta plus sine theta cosine theta. Plus, I pulled out this r, but plus this dotted with that, ignoring the r, so minus sine of theta, cosine of theta, plus sine squared theta, and then plus zero, so that's it. 
dz d theta. Now, of course, this was rigged to come out nice. The sine theta cosine theta cancels with the minus theta, cancels with the minus sine of theta cosine of theta. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So at the end of the day, we just get r squared, pull the r squared all the way out, times integral from zero to two pi, integral from zero to h of one dz d theta, and that is two pi r squared h. The units, I should have said all of um, x, y, and z were measured in meters. Our velocity vector field was meters per second. So this is coming out in cubic meters per second. Right? Cubic meters per second. That is the flux through that cylinder, the flux of that velocity vector field through the cylinder. The fact that it's positive means there's a net flow outward. Right? Maybe there's some places where the flow is into the cylinder, but the flows out overwhelm them. All right, so that's a first calculation. Let's look at a, a more complicated example. I'm going to look at a, a cone, really half a cone, and I'm going to put a top on it. And then we'll have to do the flux integral in two pieces. So another example. I want my surface to be a cone, a right circular cone, but turned upside down. So I'm going to say it's a radius 2, height 4. I don't believe I'm going to put in any units of height 4. Um, and this one will have the top. So the top and the sides. And in, it's standard when you've got a closed surface, so one that has an inside and an outside, that you pick outward pointing unit normals as the positive direction. It's not always true, and you can certainly say, oh, in this problem I picked a positive direction to be in. But if someone doesn't say, the default is that the unit normals are outward pointing. Of course, you might wonder, here on the edge, do you pick this or do you pick this? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. The edge is just a curve. We're integrating over a surface. Regardless of what you pick, it won't change the answer. So um, we will, we need, oh, I'm giving you the, the vector field that we want to look at. We're going to pick a very simple vector field. We're going to pick our vector field to be the constant vector field that's minus k. So you can picture this vector field it's just pointing straight downward of unit length. Clearly, right, this vector field just points straight down. Now, hopefully, what you can see is, oh yeah, when we, do one in a, when we do the integral over the top piece, which we'll have to do separately, we will get a negative flux because the positively oriented vector field is in the opposite direction from the, I'm sorry, the positively oriented unit normal is in the opposite direction from the vector field. Down here on the cone part, we're going to get um, a positive number because, yeah, that these vectors have a positively oriented normal component. <clears throat> All these dot products are positive because this has a downward component like that. All right, um, but then we have to add. So let me give some names to these things. Let me call the cone part of this. I'll call the cone part M1. I'll call this top part M2. And M, of course, the whole thing is the surface M. And what we'd like to calculate we want to calculate the double integral over m of d dot n ds. Of course, this breaks up into two pieces. The double integral over m1 and the double integral over m2. All right. Um, the m2 integral is going to be easier, but I'm going to save it for the end. 
So we'll do these two separately, and then we'll add. So we want to calculate this flux integral. This means we need a parameterization for that cone. We have done this before, and I'm going to lean on that, the fact that we've done this before. What we found before is that you can parameterize M1, so this cone, by P of theta Z is Z times R over H, where R is the radius and H is the height. This is what we found before. I'm going to plug in our numbers in a minute. R over H sine of theta, 1. Okay, but our R is 2, our H is 4, so we get a half and a half. So let me come over here. So I'll just write down some of our data. So I, I remind you that our vector field B is 0, 0, minus 1. We are working on calculating the flux integral just through the bottom cone part. And our parameterization with our numbers stuck in is P of theta Z is Z times we get a half cosine of theta, a half sine of theta, 1. All right, so what do you have to do? Well, you have to calculate the cross product of P sub theta, so the partial derivative with respect to theta. You have to cross that with the partial derivative of P with respect to Z. So you, know, you calculate these partial derivatives easily enough you get minus one-half sine of theta, one-half cosine of theta, zero. And the partial derivative with respect to z, it just wipes out that z right there, is one-half cosine of theta, comma, one-half sine of theta, one. And either you do this cross product or you look back and see that we did it um, in our previous section, it's I'm just saving time right now. We find that, or you do it again and you find, that P theta cross PZ is Z over 2 cosine of theta sine of theta minus 1 half. All right. Um, I should have said, I, I never set up any axes, and so maybe it wasn't clear that my cone was starting at the origin and encircling the z-axis. I really should have said that at the beginning. Right. So this is a parameterization, and this is what you get for the cross product. Um, we need to check that we have the outward pointing normal. The z-coordinates here are positive. And then that means that the z component of this cross product is negative. Well, that would be the outward pointing, an outward pointing normal. Right? I mean, we haven't made it a unit vector, but this, you don't have to make it a unit vector to see which direction it points. Take, you know, dividing by its magnitude won't change its direction. This has a downward component, which means it has to be the outward pointing normal that we pick, because those are the ones that point down, the inward pointing ones would point up, would have a positive z component. So this agrees with our orientation. If it didn't, you negate this, but it does. Um, so what do we get? Well, So our double integral over m1 of v dotted with n ds, this is um, theta goes from, ah, I didn't say this, theta is going from 0 to 2 pi, z is going from 0 to 4, I should have said that before when I wrote the parameterization. Um, our, our vector field v 
is just the constant vector field. So at least that part of this problem is easy. And then you dot width, and then it's P theta cross PZ. So we're dotting this with Z over 2 times. And then, as I did before, we're going to dot with, there's something with a 0 here and a 0 here. It doesn't matter what's in these first two spots. Yeah, we could put it in, but it doesn't matter because it's going to be multiplied by 0. But what we do get is the minus a half. We need that. Right? It's not that we couldn't put those in. It's just they're going to be multiplied by 0, so it's just a waste of time and space and general effort. And then we have dz here and d theta here. So what do you get? You get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 4, you get the z over 2, this dot product gives you 0 times, times this plus 0 times this plus minus 1 times that. So you get z over 2 times another half. So you get a z over 4 dz d theta. Um, you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi. I'll pull out the fourth. 1 fourth the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Um, and then the integral of z dz, z squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to 4, and you still have d theta. You plug in 4, you get 16, 8, 2, and then times another 2 pi from the other integral, so 4 pi. I didn't put in any units, so it's just unitless. We get 4 pi for the flux integral through the bottom part of our cone. So we just found, what we had n goes this way. The, this was M1. This was M1. M2 was up here with unit normals pointing upward. All right. So we found that the flux through the M1 is 4 pi. All right. But we want the total flux. So now we have to add to that the flux through M2. Let me go ahead and record that we just found that this was 4 pi. And here, we're not going to have to parameterize. And they go, what? How is that possible? Well, it's because this is flat. Um, uh, the, the integral over m2 of v dot n ds. What is it? It's, well, let me hold off on this. The, the v is what it was before, 0, 0, minus 1. But the outward pointing unit normal, because that's flat, you can just see it. It's k. Right? It, it doesn't change. It always just points upward. And it has unit length. Well, that's the vector k. There's no choice what this is. It's 0, 0, 1. And ds, well, we usually use ds when we're talking about kind of curved surface area, but it's flat. This is what we normally write as da, indicating that it's flat. And then you indicate, you indicate, you integrate over, well, just m2. It's just that there's no curved area, so it's just. You, know, you just think of it as x and y, or think of it in polar coordinates, r and theta. But in fact, we don't need to think of it as much of anything, because this dot product is minus 1. This is minus the integral of m2. Whether you write dA or ds, it's this. You integrate little blobs of area over the entire surface, you get the area of m2. But it's a disk, so the inside of a circle of radius 2. So you get minus. The area of a circle, pi times the radius squared. So you get minus 4 pi. So the integral over m2 is minus 4 pi. And we didn't have to parameterize anything. When you have a flat piece of a surface that's, that's, that has a normal vector, you know, an outward pointing normal, that's either plus or minus k, plus or minus i, or plus or minus j, you don't need to parameterize those. They're flat. You can see the, the outward pointing unit normal, ds just becomes da. You just use 
your regular variables like x and y, you know, z is fixed. So what do we get for the, the total flux integral? Well, hopefully you were paying attention. It's the sum of this one and this one, the sum over what you get on m1 plus what you get over m2. It's 4 pi minus 4 pi. I'll do it in my head. Zero. The, the total flux through that surface is zero. Is that a surprise? Well, you might think, well, of course it's zero. Because if you think in terms of fluid flow, you might think, well, isn't it true that however much goes in must come out? And if that's true, that in a given moment in time, that however much is going in has to be coming out and balancing out, then of course the total flux through a closed surface would have to be zero. But it's not true that that has to happen. But how could it fail to happen? Well, you know, maybe your fluid is compressible, so it just bunches up inside and stays that way. But maybe there's a drain inside your enclosed region where everything's going down the drain or some of it's going down the drain or maybe there's a source of liquid, of fluid. Um, so I just, that we give names to these things. It, the, the flux through a closed surface need not be zero. So closed, you know, it's we put this top on it, so it surrounds some solid region in space, so it's the boundary of some solid region in space. The flux through a closed surface need not be zero. In this example it is, but that doesn't have to happen. If the flux, if the flux through a closed surface with, as I said, you pick with outward pointing positive direction. So for a closed surface, as I said, it's standard to pick the positive orientation to be outward. So the flux through a closed surface with outward pointing positive orientation Is, is positive, all right, what would that mean? The outward direction is positive and the total flux is positive. That means you have a net flow of stuff outward. That means somehow fluids being created, if you're thinking fluid flow, um, fluids being produced inside there. We say there's a source. This is, this is meant to capture your physical intuition, a source inside the surface. Um, what if it's negative? If the, if, the net, if the flux is negative, that means there's a net flow inward, and you would suspect it's going somewhere. So. If the flux through a closed surface, again with outward pointing, is negative, then stuff's going in and you suspect it's going down a drain or something, we say there's a sink inside the surface. Source and a sink. You know, the sink is theoretically where the fluid is going since there's a net flow in. All right. I want to do one more example. Um, I've talked about velocity vector fields, and, but you probably the most common use of flux is um, when you've got a force field, and you talk about the flux of a force field, in particular electric, an electric field or gra a gravitational field um, through, a, through a surface. So I do want, I, I'll do an example without units, but I am thinking of the force case because I'm about to write down a, a force field that you get either from gravitation or from um, electric charge. 
So, and in this one, we'll partially use a parameterization, but we'll also appeal to geometry to get a lot of the data in the flux integral. So example, I'm thinking of a force field, even though there won't be units. Suppose we've got a vector field that is some constant over x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the 3 halves times xyz. If you remember um, spherical coordinates, and you need to at this point, this, the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is distance from the origin. We call that rho. So this is k over rho cubed. And it's nice, so it won't be confused with r's, it's nice to call the position vector out to x, y, z, to call that rho, the vector rho. All right. Um, so that's our vector field. And I want to take our surface to be a sphere of radius r centered at the origin. And as I said a couple of times now, because this is a closed surface, we'll pick outward, the outward pointing unit normal as the positive direction. We want to calculate the flux. So this is our surface m. We want to calculate the flux, f dot n ds over this surface. Well, how do you parameterize the sphere? You use spherical coordinates with r, with rho, sorry, with rho being fixed at r. Now, we've done this um, in the spherical coordinate section, so I'm not going to even write down the parameterization of the sphere in spherical coordinates. But what I do want to write is that, so you parameterize, I'll, I'll write that, that's what you do, parameterize using spherical coordinates. rho, theta, and phi, but rho is fixed. Rho is fixed at being r, right? We're just on the sphere, so where rho is constantly r. Theta, as always in spherical coordinates, theta goes between 0 and 2 pi, or as usual, and phi goes from 0 to pi. I'm not going to write down the parameterization because all I want to use is that, well, we have that theta and phi, right? those are our bounds on theta and phi, and we've done this calculation of little chunks of area in spherical coordinates on a sphere before. We did this earlier, and we got r squared sine phi d phi d theta. So that's ds. What do we do about n? Well, it's true that we could write down the parameterization and take the cross product of, of r sub phi cross with r sub theta, but it's a sphere. And the outward pointing unit normal at a point is the same as the position vector out to the point, which is rho equals x, y, z, except you make it a unit vector. So the outward pointing unit normal, we don't need to calculate it. It's just x, y, z divided by its magnitude. It's just rho. The vector rho divided by the magnitude of rho. Well, the magnitude of rho is the radius of this sphere. So our outward pointing unit normals are just at any point x, y, z on the sphere. It's just x, y, z divided by r. You don't have to do any calculation to know that. 
Um, so what do we get for our flux integral? All right, so what do we get for our flux integral? Well, we plug in everything. Theta is going from 0 to 2 pi. V is going from 0 to pi. We need um, our vector field F, but we're not going to need our parameterization, and you'll see why. You get our vector field F we wrote as k over rho cubed, that's the scalar rho, times the vector rho. And then you dot with n, but we just found n is rho over r. n is the vector rho divided by r. ds, which is um, r squared sine phi d phi d theta. And really, we could have gotten by without this part, and I'll explain, or without using our old calculation of that part, but I'll explain in a minute. So what do you get here? You get, um, we had rho cubed, but at all of our points, rho, right, rho is the, the scalar rho is fixed at being r. This is r cubed, and I should have written f that way before. f is, we're saying, kind of exists everywhere. So our vector field everywhere is k over rho cubed times the, the vector field rho. But k on m, if you only look at points where uh, distance r from the origin is given by, and this is what's important to us, k over r cubed times rho, because we the scalar rho, distance from the origin, is fixed at being r. So we get this, but rho dotted with rho. <laughs> right? We have a rho dotted with rho. Rho dotted with rho, remember the dot product of a vector with itself. It's just its magnitude squared. But the magnitude of rho is exactly what's r, so that's r squared. So you get an r squared there. So you get an r to the fourth in the numerator, but you have an r to the fourth in the denominator. This rho dotted with rho gives you an r squared. But then you've got r to the fourth up here, r to the fourth down there. All the r's cancel out. You can pull the k out. Um, you can pull the k out, and you get k times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi of sine phi, d phi, d theta. Now, of course, this is, this is ds for area on a, well, we had an r squared, but if r were 1, this would be ds. Well, this, then this thing is the surface area of a sphere of radius 1, so 4 pi r squared, so just 4 pi. That's why I was saying we could have avoided kind of this explicit reference to our calculation earlier of ds. This part better come out to be 4 pi, so you get 4 pi k. Now you can check that you, know, you can do this double integral, this iterated integral, and see that you get 4 pi. But it is what you get. Um, assuming, uh, assuming that if f is in Newton, so I was thinking of this as a force field, And I'm thinking of all the distances in, so x, y, and z in meters. What are the units on this flux? Well, it's not supposed to be complicated. The, the dot product just picks out the magnitude, the sine magnitude of the component of f. So this has units of newtons. That has units of square meters. So newtons times square meters. So this is newton times square meters. This is the flux. Um, this is actually an important calculation uh, related to electric fields and Gauss's law. 
Um, the cool, one of the cool things about it is the reference to R disappeared. Right? It didn't matter what the radius of the sphere was. We could have picked a sphere of any positive radius whatsoever, and all the references to R cancel out, and you get the same flux from this field through a surface of any radius. So that's kind of cool. Um, all right, that's an example. Those are examples of how you calculate flux integrals. Um, they are cumbersome to calculate. In the next section, we're going to look at the divergence theorem. And in a, in a sense, the divergence theorem plays the same role with respect to flux integrals that Green's theorem played with respect to line integrals. That in, in Green's theorem, what you get is, oh, you want the line integral around a closed curve. And instead, you write it as a double integral over the area that's enclosed by the curve. In the divergence theorem, we want to calculate a flux integral over a closed surface. And instead, we'll write it as a triple integral over the solid region enclosed by the surface. But um, it, makes, it, it makes a lot of flux integrals over closed surfaces easier for us, provided that the triple integral over the solid region is easier than parameterizing surfaces and calculating flux integrals from the definition. But of course, it depends on your examples, which one's easier, so we'll see.